Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hutchins. I'm the executive director of the Maine Association of Nonprofits, and welcome to another edition of MAMP Connects. Uh, we started this program back in 2020. Uh, at this point, we all probably understand what that means. Um, yes, we started this program uh, during the lockdown to provide an opportunity for our uh, nonprofit colleagues from across the state of Maine to meet every week to find out what was going on. Um, as we will all recall, um, there was a, an extreme amount of concern and worry and uncertainty about what was going to be happening, um, not only to ourselves and our families and our friends, but um, to the important work that nonprofits do across our state and how we are going to navigate it. So we started this program in order to provide immediate information that MAMP was gathering from Washington, D.C. and from Augusta, and also to just give everyone a sense of that you're not alone. And we found that even post um, immediate um, emergencies caused by the um, aftermath of the pandemic, that people still really valued MAMP Connects uh, because it turned turns out the connection is really, really important, especially in this day and age where we are all so virtual. Yes, that's a wonderful thing. We have a guest who's going to be talking with us today from the Outer Banks. That's incredible. Um, and uh, as humans, we still need to be in contact and we need to know that we are one big human family. And as a um, as a successful, thriving ecosystem, we need to be there for each other. We need to be able to see each other. We need to be able to feel each other in our in, in our hearts and in our spirits. So we are we have been continuing at MAMP Connects. Our next MAMP Connects is going to be our 50th, 50th. MAMP Connects, which is just incredible because my um, co-team person here, Kelly McCormick, has been an incredible partner. We've been having so much fun, haven't we, Kelly, um, producing these MAMP Connects. So I just want to say how grateful I am to all of you being here this morning. It means so much to us. And you, by being here, you are spreading the love. Um, because uh, we know that many of you come and you listen and then you share with us how important it is for you uh, to see that there are other people who are uh, experiencing some of the same um, trials and tribulations and also joys and celebrations um, working in the nonprofit field here in Maine. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, before we get started, uh, I do want to thank our uh, just incredible partners at Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. Uh, they sponsor us in many, many ways, and they're huge fans of MAMP Connects. And as a nonprofit themselves, they really do understand um, the value of community and connection. So thank you to Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. And um, and then uh, so this morning's program, what we decided to do today is talk about the workforce. And you uh, hope you may, um, if you haven't heard about how MAMP has I certainly been um, looking at workforce as critical to an issue for nonprofits across this state. Obviously, the competitiveness of the workforce is something that is impacting all sectors um, all across the country. Um, and we have been trying to work with our national partners at the National Council of Nonprofits, our sister associations across the country, to think about some of the unique needs of the workforce in the nonprofit sector. Uh, because while certainly there are challenges and the other sectors, we think that um, there is a critical need to be looking at workforce with regards to nonprofits that are serving our communities and providing the critical needs um, and providing the critical programs and services that frankly are just getting worse. Um, it, uh, I it, So I just want to um, say that today we thought that what we could talk about was highlight some of our member organizations and, and partners out there in Maine that are working to highlight opportunities for underserved, undervalued communities that want to go to work and are com coming up with some really creative, innovative ways of connecting businesses um, and um, organizations that need workers um, with those communities that are completely ready to be put to work and but may need some extra support with networking and, and that sort of thing. So I'm excited if you're here to learn a little bit about 
what these organizations are doing. I'm super excited to introduce you to all three of these people. I know them personally. They're all stellar people in our community that are working really, really hard um, to connect people to the workforce. So um, I'm going to start out by inviting Bill Benson to the to the screen. How are you today, ben Bill Benson? Bill? Good morning. <laughs> Didn't mean to call you by your last name. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Everybody, Bill is the executive director of Boots to Roots. And um, Boots to Roots, if you haven't heard their story, is um, is really they really do have a remarkable story. Um, I could interview um, Bill for this entire time, but he's a he's uh, I'm sure you're off there enjoying your August. So we're only going to keep you for a few minutes, but we wanted to uh, make sure that we talk to you guys about what you're doing, connecting veterans to the main workforce. And I'm just going to, I know that you have some lived experience, in fact. And so um, I'm just going to dive right in and just say, what do you guys do? And what's what are some of the unique circumstances for veterans with regards to finding work in Maine? Yeah, thanks. Um, so Boost Roots is a, is a Maine-based nonprofit. Um, we organized in 2016, and I came on board as the first paid employee in 2019, so we're still re relatively new. And we help veterans who are transitioning out of the military find work in Maine and get connected to Maine employers. And, and why that's important is because there aren't any large military bases in Maine any longer since Brunswick closed. And transitions are hard in any, in any case, right? Um, but for veterans who are leaving service, they're leaving behind um, usually everything they know. And for many, for many of them, it's the first time they've ever applied for a civilian job. So how do you translate, how do they translate their military experiences into skills that hiring managers are going to understand and value? Um, and so we help with that with resume and, and interview coaching um, with, our, with our network of resume and interview coaches who are all here in Maine. Uh, but as importantly, we help connect them to opportunities in Maine, Maine businesses and employers who are eager to hire um, veterans. And um, and sometimes those connections are the are the most difficult piece. And it's really the value that we add that makes us different than any other organization that may be help with resume or interview interview coaching. But we're all veterans who do this and um, have been through our own transition. So we understand some of the, the challenges uh, that that. That veterans face. Um, you asked about some of the unique challenges to being a veteran, and I mentioned the fact that for many of them, they're they're applying for their first post military job, and um, really for for many of them, just knowing just um, knowing the types of opportunities that exist in Maine um, is is an important aspect of what we do. So, um, as an example. Uh, we've talked to many veterans who may have left the state 10 or 20 years ago, and their their uh, perception of Maine is not a place that's a thriving, you know, thriving economic opportunity with lots of jobs. Right. When they left, maybe the economy was very different and they don't they don't think that they can uh, find meaningful work and uh, find success for them and their families when they come here. So providing information about and connections to employers and and information about opportunities uh, to employers in the state is one of the biggest things that we do um, as part of that network. Um, we so, also can we also connect them to um, we call them peer mentors. And these are people who have already found success here in, in Maine and they're veterans themselves. So they can talk about the, the transition challenges and give them an example of what uh, success looks like in Maine for them. Right. Speaking of success, um, I know you guys have a lot of success stories. Uh, I was wondering if you could share a couple so that people can really get a sense of how the whole um, ecosystem at Boots of Roots it works. Yeah, so uh, to date, we've helped over 232 veterans find success in Maine um, from in, in, with employers from Berwick to Presque Isle. Um, there are so many success stories that we could talk about. Uh, one of the most recent ones, and actually... Um, you know, we recently hired uh, a new program director, Randy Bell, who's coming out of the Navy after 22 years in the Navy. He was actually stationed in Japan at the time and and we're not from Maine, uh, which is maybe surprisingly typical of the folks that we work with who maybe aren't originally from the state, so don't have family connections or other connections here in the state. Um, but he was committed to coming back uh, or coming to Maine. and uh, But living in Japan at the time with his family, wife and two kids, 
And um, so they reached out to us 12 months, more than 12 months before they were going to arrive here in the state and um, really didn't have any clue as to what opportunities were here, where they were going to live, what local communities were like um, for, for them, what the schools were like for their kids. And so we were able to provide um, that type of information. And through working with him and working with him on his resume, we started to realize this guy's a pretty special guy. We'd really like him to be part of Boots to Roots team. So let's start talking to him about bringing him on um, on our team because we were looking to to add to our our, our staff. Um, but as importantly, we started working with his spouse, Georgette. And um, we actually found her a job before we had figured out what we were going to do with Randy. Uh, Georgette's a dental hygienist. She's now working for Catholic Charities. So, mm. um, you know, so that's another aspect of what we do is helping the spouses of transitioning military members. It, and quite honestly, if we can find uh, success for the spouse, we've locked in that tr military member, right? If the spouse can find success here and 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 um, and we can we can grab her into the 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 network, the the community in Maine. Um, we're going to find success for the veteran as well. It, so it's all part of the process. Um, so that's a great success story. They they were able to find work. They both had jobs before they arrived in Maine. And what that allows them to do, one of the significant challenges that veterans have when they leave, uh, when they leave the military is without a, a current job, right? And if, so if they're leaving the military, they don't, they, they, they can't count that as employment. So how do you find a place to live if you don't have a job, you can't qualify for a mortgage. And oftentimes you can't qualify even to rent an apartment. So here's someone who's been very successful. They're a veteran. They're, they've got a job. They know they're leaving. They may be living uh, outside of the state. They, typically they are, um, but they want to come to Maine. But they can't, they can't put an offer on a house because they can't qualify for a mortgage because they don't have employment lined up. And so they fall in, there's this gap uh, that veterans face. And so how do they, it's a, it's a, becomes a big hurdle for someone to pick up their family and move mm. if you don't even know where you're going to be living. And so we've got lots of examples, um, uh, Anthony and Emily Koss, uh, you know, who, well, actually Randy did this too, uh, li living in a trailer in a campground for, for months at a time while they mm. figure out how they're how they're going to survive and live in 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 uh in maine mm -hmm. and this goes back to our founders um dave hickey's experience coming to maine out of the air force um master's degree all kinds of executive experience he's from maine he's from the china lakes region uh four kids came back thought hey i'm coming back home i'm not going to have a problem finding work and really struggled making connections and at one point didn't know where he he and his family were going to live because he hadn't had a job and so couldn't couldn't qualify for a mortgage or or to rent an apartment. And so connecting them and and getting them jobs early, you know, helps alleviate a lot of that challenge. But we also can connect them with realtors and and um, community uh, communities and other veterans who live in communities that can show them a pathway to success. So um, I, I just. Uh... First of all, point out that means that um, the first couple you mentioned are working for main nonprofits and members of MAMP. So yep. just um, and uh, but, you know, it, what's dawning on me, Bill, is this that um, I, and I come from a background with a father who is in the military. And um, what is occurring to me is that one of one of the critical roles that Boots to Roots plays is vouching for the person. Um, because I can imagine as an employer myself, and I, you know, and looking at resumes, if I saw a military resume, a lot of the language, a lot yeah. of the titles, the experience doesn't easily always translate to what we're looking for from a skill level. And so um, it's occurring to me that I think this is probably going to be a commonality across all of our guests this morning is being able to translate for the employer the value of that person. Um, and you as a veteran and the members of the, the employees and the staff at Boots to Roots can say, listen, this role that this person played in the military would be perfect for this role at a nonprofit in Maine or at a company in Maine. Um, would you agree with that? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say that's one of the the things that actually we probably spend the most time at is helping uh, military members translate their skills. Yeah. Um, and and so when you look at you know a booster, our format for our resume, there's very little. You can almost not. You can go through the whole thing and not realize the person was in the military. Oh, um, interesting. Because yeah. we're trying, we're real, we're we're trying to take their job title that they had in the military, and we put us, we make it into a civilian job title, so it's relatable. Hmm. And we're not trying to cover over or hide. We're just trying to make it so right. that uh, a, a, an HR person can look at it and say, "Hey, I understand what this person did." And we've heard so many times from businesses and folks in in the HR field where they they get a resume and they look at it and they say, "Wow, this person's done a lot of stuff." I just don't know how they would fit into our organization. Right. And so that the it's not that they turn it's not that they reject the resume, they just put it aside because That's they don't right. know, they don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And so we can ha have that conversation. I mean, hopefully we're we've done the the work on the resume up front. So to help civilianize it for lack of a better term, but we can also have a conversation, right? And and we've become more of a uh a known entity so businesses are comfortable reaching out and asking questions if they have questions about right about something so something. before i let you go um I, we have a couple more minutes um before i invite the next guest but um <clears throat> if you're an employer it, put yourself in the shoes of of an employer in maine in particular you know we're talking mostly about nonprofit employers what is your advice to them if people are hearing about boots to roots and and understanding that there might be an untapped resource there what is your advice for an employer to to get started down the path of reaching out to the veteran un, uh, veterans who might be looking for work in Maine? Yeah, uh, please contact us. Um, Bootsroots.org is our website. There's a contact button there. You can reach out to me directly. Um, we are always looking to talk to employers, and we want to promote what you're doing. Um, I mentioned up front that one of the biggest challenges for veterans is figuring out what you want to do, right? They, they, they typically want jobs with purpose. Many of them are looking for jobs with purpose. The nonprofit community offers that in spades, right? I mean, this is what, this is what the nonprofit organ, uh, community is all about. Yep. I, I'm probably on the MAMP job page weekly uh, mm -hmm. because we're always mining jobs and uh, off of that and to provide examples to veterans about what kind of opportunities there are in Maine to do meaningful work. So um, please contact us for the other nonprofits. If, you, if you're looking for employees, please contact us to let us know about your programs. We'd love to spotlight your organization to our teammates to let them know about um, the type of opportunities that they, they could have to do meaningful work in the state. Thank you, Bill. And one last question. What is your, uh, what's one thing, I know there are many, but what's one thing that comes to mind that uh, that an employer can do to make their workplace welcoming to the veterans? The um, the easiest thing, well, I, and I, I know a lot of nonprofits are smaller organizations. If you ever have uh, someone with a military background, uh, a veteran themselves, or someone like you who had a, a parent, you know, you have memories of your of your father in the in the service. Just making that connection to let folks know that they're not they're not really they're not different. Like like they they can be part of of your organization and part of your community. And just having that that finding that. Um, that point of reference, I think, is is really, really valuable. Um, so if you do have veterans on your staff or people who have a background in the military, we just hired a military spouse ourselves on our staff, as an example, because we know the value of making those connections, right? And so and it, it doesn't have to be a veteran. It, it can be a spouse. It can be a family member who had that connection who, who as a point of reference. Um, so identifying those folks um, and putting them in touch with the veteran as they come on board, I think is very helpful. Great, thank you so much, Bill. The work that you guys are doing is so important. Um, I'm so glad you're part of our community. It's great to be, it's great to be in this network with you, Bill. I hope you enjoy the rest of your summer. Thank you so much. Okay, take care. Yeah. Um, the next person I'm gonna um, invite up is a new friend of mine, Karen. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. good. How are you? Good. How's the weather down there? It's hot and humid. I forgot how hot and humid it gets here. <laughs> I'm like, I'm missing the best part of Maine and the raw, this is a poor, poor planning on our part. But yeah, well, Karen, you are a relatively new Mainer, right? Officially. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, you know, when it comes to summer in Maine, we really don't leave. 
So. No, I know. <laughs> Next summer, I will not be leaving. You will not be leaving. Great. No, well, well, not to come here anyway. Welcome to MAMP Connects. Is this your first yeah. one as a, I, you've listened before maybe. I have listened before, but I, this okay. is, uh, yeah, obviously. First time on screen. Yeah. yeah. Well, welcome. Um, uh, Karen is, um, is the executive director, right, of the mm -hmm. United Recovery Fund. And, um, and she, uh, I'm going to let you tell the story about United Re Recovery Fund and the community that you are all working with, um, with regards to providing um, employment and connecting employers and workers. Sure. Well, initially we were started, we were called the Maine Recovery Fund, and we were a direct connection to Maine Works with Margot Walsh, who was the founder of that, the first B Corp in Maine. And um and was she was dealing with folks that were uh, connected to the criminal justice system and in most times in early recovery that um, had just a myriad of other issues. And so trying to get them, um, they, getting them employed, but then realizing all the other things that come with that, you know, that there's no transportation that they can access. They don't have driver's license. They don't have a car. They don't have a, a winter coat for the main winters. They don't have steel toe boots. Most of our employees, my clients, main works employees are, um, you know, they have not had a lot of experience in the workforce. They're young. And so her customers are the some of the largest construction companies in Maine and now in uh, we've moved into New Hampshire. We've uh, done a little work in Massachusetts. We're exploring Connecticut um, again, which is why we're now United Recovery Fund to show that the broader uh, footprint. Um, but construction was a really great place for them to be. They could make good wages. Uh, they could start and work their way up. It's a very much a, a value-based uh, type of employment. So you show up day after day and the supervisor notices that and you have opportunities to advance. Um, so it was a great connecting point with folks that have um, very little employment um, experience. So, but the all the other stuff that comes with it because they didn't get into this situation that they're in overnight with the involvement with the criminal justice system and the substance use. Um, so there's, it takes time to unravel some of the stuff that they've uh, been mixed up in and, and just had to deal with. So um, yeah, oftentimes they come to us right out of, they've gotten out of jail or prison, they're in a recovery house, they don't have a job yet, so they can't really make their rent. They don't have, you know, just the basic needs of, you know, toiletries and clothing. So we really help with all that so that they can come up and they can show up at a job site confident. They've got everything that they need, a tool belt and some basic tools, and they're able to, you know, start off on the right foot toward their journey to self-sufficiency. And we're not strictly um, there for main works anymore. We actually do help other people who have barriers to the workforce, um, you know, with one-offs, not in, you know, the same, at the same level we do with the folks that are working for Maine Works, but you know, if they you know need, I don't know, a cell phone paid or something like that that helps them connect with their job, it has to be related to their their employment. Um, but we will help with other organizations and other people too uh, to get them back to work, whatever that takes. So it's just it's a really it's a wonderful organization. It's a um, it's just great to see the hope come back in in mostly these men lives and, and see them really take that step to to the path forward, you know, just kind of leave their their past behind and really have that hope for a brighter future. Well, and just as I was saying to Bill, um, uh, the the importance that Maine works and um, and the work that you all are doing in terms of, again, um, being able to be that conduit to opening doors and um, giving potential employers the reassurance be, that you have the experience working with a community that they may have some trepidation about reaching out to and working with. Um, and just because in the case of Boots to Roots, it's just not understanding where they're coming from. Right. And 
you know, what's striking me is both Bill and you were talking about just basic needs um, that some of these some of these um, candidates, potential candidates need, you know, housing, you know, clothing, um, those types of supports. And and so just highlighting the critical nature of if we want to grow our workforce in Maine, we need to think more comprehensively about what potential employees need. You mentioned construction. Of course, we're talking to nonprofits here in Maine and you've worked in the nonprofit field for a long time. Um, are What are some of the, can you imagine some of the work that some of the um, people that, that the Recovery Fund is working with and the population there could translate into work in the nonprofit field? Yeah, I think there's opportunity for that. I don't think yeah. that we haven't spent a lot of time working on that. And that's some sure. of the stuff that Margaret and I've been talking about is how we can expand, especially for women, because it's yeah. not an easy, it's not a natural fit necessarily to have a woman on a construction site. So we've, I think uh, she's exploring what some of those other opportunities could be. And then we will follow right along with providing the support uh, to the to the folks. You know, we are we're really dealing with just the basic folks coming right starting in the workforce. So um, there's not a natural progression to the nonprofit world necessarily, but that doesn't mean that there's not folks that can do that. One of the women that uh, started early on is now in the healthcare world. She works for Maine Health. Um, and so she started at, started in uh, in a construction position and now she's you know been certified and, and has a really great job in the healthcare field. So there's certainly ways to make the connections once you have your feet on the ground and start to, to get some stability in your life. You can do whatever you want. I uh, my former organization I was with probably 25 to 30 percent of my workforce had come was dealing with the criminal background and with the substance use. And you know there's some of the most committed people that you could mm -hmm. hire because they're just so grateful at being given a second chance to be able to, to show that they do have value and they, they can show up. And that's half the battle is just getting them, you know, giving them the opportunity to show up and prove themselves. So I'll ask you the same questions I asked Bill. Um, uh, well, actually, first, um, do you have a particular success story you guys like to show as an example? You know, there's a lot of them. We helped, I think, 340 people last year. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously there's a lot of churn at first because not everybody's ready, you know, yeah. work workforce ready. Yeah. So, but once the longer they stay, the longer they stay and the better off they do. But we have one gentleman um, who's allowed us to share his story. His name's Will Fredo. And he has, um, he's just a star. I mean, he's been with us for about a year now. He's um, gotten his driver's license back. Uh, he's connected with our our bank, who has been just wonderful at um, helping them kind of replace that fear with knowledge and looking at their financial situation and seeing how you can get over those hurdles by paying off some of your debt. So they helped them put a debt payment plan in place, which allowed them to pay off their fees for the, the vehicle. You know, Maine isn't different than other states where they, you know, the first thing they do is connect uh, your bad behavior to your driver's license, which is just so ridiculous, you know, whether it's it's um, child support or something else that just, you know, it just further handcuffs our folks to, 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 for employment and stuff. So to get the fines paid off and to make him eligible for his driver's license, get his driver's license, now he's car shopping. And, you know, so that is, it's just something we all take for granted, but when you don't have a vehicle, it just, and you don't have the way to get to work or to get anything else. It's really, it's really a hard life. I mean, we don't live in a community that has vast public transportation and, you know, even getting to a job site, you can get part of the way there, but the last mile and, you know, in the, in the main winters, you can't exactly get on a bike and, and ride to, to the job site. So it's, this is going to be a big help. And then what we they often do is then once they get their driver's license in a car, they'll end up carpooling some of the other guys from their site. So that helps us spread our transportation budget even further for new people that come in. So he's probably been one of our local stars and I haven't met a whole lot of them, but um, he's just he stands out to me. 
So. And if there um, is a nonprofit employer on this call or who listens to the recording at a later date and is curious about um, potentially connecting with the clients, um, how do you recommend they do that? And how do they go about what are the steps they should take? I would just say have them call me or they can reach out to through the website that we have a program manager now that does intake with every one of our clients and kind of looks at what their what their current situation is, but then also what their dreams and their goals are. And he, Barry, would know more than anybody who uh, might have a, a connection or a desire to, to get into this type of work, to get into the nonprofit field, or may even have some experience. So I would say reach out to, to our program manager through our website and see uh, if there are folks that, that might make that connection easier. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Karen, um, for yeah. coming in from North Carolina. I appreciate you taking the time to to meet. And it's nice to see you again. Even Yes, you virtual. too. And um, Maine is here when you're ready to come home. Well, and I'm, <laughs> I will be there right after Labor Day. And I'm not okay. leaving anytime soon. We're building a house <laughs> and we're making Maine September home. is actually one of my favorite months. I know. I can't care, so. we, got here, we got here September 30th. So I haven't spent the month in September. Oh, that'll be your anniversary? Oh. Yeah, October 1st was the first day of our lease. So yeah. Oh, good. Well, anyway. welcome to Maine. Um, Thank you. And welcome to the nonprofit community. We're really lucky to have you um, part of the leadership and the networking and another person with purpose here in our yes. beautiful state. So I look forward you, to meeting a lot of you on the call that yeah. I haven't had a chance to meet a lot of folks yet because I'm fairly new to this role. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, everybody for reach out to Karen. She's a star. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Karen. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. And my um, third guest for today is Shay Bellis. How are you, Shay? Hi, so good to see you. Nice to see you. I was really, really fortunate to have um, my coworker, Kelly, um, invite three three friends uh, to the screen. So I was like, oh, this is going to be easy peasy. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Shay is a um, co-chair of the Diversity Hiring Coalition. Did I get that right? Yeah. Great. And um, I, uh, we invited you to the screen because um, hiring coalition, diversity hiring coalition, my understanding of what the work you're doing is very much in line with what Bill and Karen were just talking about, about breaking down the barriers to make sure all people who um, want to work in Maine have what they need to be successful. Um, I think, though, with a very, very much of a focus on the employer side. Um, and so I'll stop talking there and you can clarify for me whether I got right or wrong and <laughs> what you want to add. Excellent. Well, Jennifer, you usually get most things right. So uh -huh. um, not much to correct <laughs> there, but um, <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we are an organization. Uh, we're based in Maine and we focus on promoting diversity and inclusion in the workplace. And so I'll define what that actually means in just a second. But the mission is really to provide leadership, connections, education, uh, resources to main employers and businesses and nonprofits um, in order to foster more diversity in their organization. And so currently um, the coalition is dedicated on working on four sort of strategic areas, if you will, and I'll, I'll put them um I'll put them in the chat as well so people can kind of get a, a better feel for what that looks like. But the aging workforce, um, as well as racial and ethnic, so the BIPOC community, LGBTQ+, um, and then workplace accessibility we added this year. Um, and we uh, basically, we collaborate with Maine, uh, SHRM, SHRM's the state council. Um, and then we're an endorsing sponsor of the Maine HR convention. So Basically, we kind of bring together. Just quickly, so what's the acronym, SHRM? So uh, SHRM is the state HR membership. I'm I'm messing it up. Oh, it's sorry, I didn't mean like to put that. you on the spot. No, but no, it's no, no, the no. statewide uh, HR council. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Society you, for uh, HR Management. Thank, thank you, Joanna. You, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so uh, me not being the HR, my co-chair is the HR uh, director at the Botanical Gardens. And I sort of represent more of the entrepreneurial business leader side of that. And having the two within the organization is great because the kind of collective group or ecosystem of our members, it, it is HR, but it's also like the recruitment, diversity and equity inclusion. 
really anybody in the organization who really cares about wanting to make their workplace inclusive. So in some instances, that's the marketing director. Um, in other instances, it's the director of sales. Um, and so the members of the coalition basically um, come together and they benefit from network opportunities, accessing diverse sort of candidate resumes, um, collaborative sort of outreach we could partner with. Um, but the four tiers are really education and everyone's at a different path with this. Some folks are in a, you know, very homogenous work environment and everybody's kind of like everybody um, and others are looking to um, expand upon an already flourishing, diverse um, ecosystem. And so uh, we try to provide education uh, that kind of reaches everyone where they're at. And then the second piece is recruitment. So for organizations that are interested in um, bringing on their first fill in the blank of what that diversity is, female, um, neurodivergent, uh, BIPOC, uh, young person, older person, uh, veteran, <laughs> veteran, exactly right, yes, uh, blind person, deaf person, um, whatever that is, there's um, usually a lot of fear um, and a lot of uncertainty. And, um, you know, how do I, how do I recruit without offending? How do I, um, you know, how do I write that job description to attract, um, you know, those types of things. So that recruitment piece is something we focus quite a bit on. And then once you have recruited your first or second or third, it's about retention. Um, you, you made the decision uh, strategically to do this. You were successful in recruiting somebody, but now how do you make sure that the culture is one in which is supportive and nurturing for everyone within the company to make sure that you retain those folks? And then for the businesses, nonprofits, and organizations that have had some success with that, um, we encourage those members to teach. Tell us what you did. How did you figure it out? What worked? What didn't? Um, how, you know, what what to avoid, what tuition cost can you save us in this journey? Uh, what resource was helpful for you? Um, you know, it, where we cover every industry, whether it be construction or it be marketing or professional services, you know, the resources are going to be different. And so if you find a resource that works, share it. Um, so that last <clears throat> component is teaching. And so basically um, what what I would like to do instead of giving you sort of a, what are some of our successful stories um, is give you kind of a sampling, if I can, of like our bi-monthly topics, because I think Great. that will demonstrate for a little better what we um, what we try to accomplish. So um, we had the Divi Division of Blind and Visually Impaired with the main deaf of hard of hearing and uh, the main neurodivergence um, leaders come to a panel in our bi-monthly um, piece and they brought a guest that sort of fit that um, category of person and we had an open discussion what are some of the what are some of the biases people have what are some of the questions that they just assume and hear directly from the mouths of these folks whether or not those things were accurate or inaccurate uh, we used some use cases. Um, my company, Navator, hired um, an intern who uh, had recently graduated from marketing and he was blind. And I talked about what that journey was like for me as somebody who's never really interacted with nor hired a blind person to do a job um, and sort of my journey through that. So everyone there sort of learned, wow, here's this whole ecosystem of people that are ready, willing, and turns out extremely high retention, very loyal population of potential employees. And so they were able to learn how to access them and, and learn more about what they would or wouldn't actually have to do for accommodations for these folks to enhance their company. Um, we also had uh, Mandy Levine do a session on if you're trying to decide to write a DEI policy, what you should be considering if you write a DEI policy, uh, what should be incorporated, and how do you measure it to make sure that you, uh, you know, were, were able to successfully do what you thought you were setting out to do in the very beginning? Um, and where did that diverge? And what did that look like? And was that good or was that bad? So that was really helpful for people in a very hands-on looking at their own policy or getting ready to write a policy piece. 
Um, another uh, this year we did was with the DEI. Trans- just just letting everybody oh, yeah. know DEI. Um, it, I'm assuming it, it stands for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Policy. In this, okay. And, and yes, Andy thank is you someone. For that. That's all right. And and just letting everybody know, Kelly put a link to Mandy's website um, because she could be a resource if you're. Is that correct? Is she a yes. good resource if your yes. organization is thinking about a DEI policy? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, and you. and there are also other resources on our website. So if Mandy isn't the right fit for your particular organization, she would be the first to refer you to the right one. But um, she is also a former co-chair of the Diversity Hiring Coalition. So uh, she would very much be able to take care of anybody who reached out to her. Great. I don't, um, I'm sorry, I just, I try to keep the program to a a little bit. So I just want to go right to, um, Shay, put yourself in the shoes of a small nonprofit in Maine, and they hear about the Diversity Hiring Coalition. What what, What would you say to them about how they can get engaged and how they can prepare their organization to thinking about broadening their outreach and how they um, prepare themselves for successful onboarding of new employees? So I think I would say you're thinking about it. So that's an amazing first step. Um, Curiosity and empathy is what's going to drive your process through this. Uh, It's hard work. doing, making sure that you are deliberately, strategically, and intentionally including so that you don't accidentally exclude. And it forces folks to sort of look in a mirror that they maybe aren't comfortable with what they see. And they may find, geez, our organization isn't really where we want it to be. And so that's uncomfortable. So I would say that by reaching out to the Diversity Hiring Coalition, you'll be in good company because what I would say, our members are very humble. Um, We all understand that this work is challenging in particular in Maine, especially for the um, ethnicity diversity. Um, But let's change that narrative. There are a lot of people of color. There are a lot of people that are blind, visually impaired. There are a lot of folks that are there and let us help you find them and let us help you figure out what's the best way to recruit and retain them. Um, But you're not alone and, and don't be alone or else you'll want to give up. Um, it really, much like the, the MAMP community, it, it takes a lot of people and a lot of resources and a lot of support to be able to do this work. And so uh, don't go it alone would be my major message. Just reach out. Others are doing the work and are there to help you. Yeah, that's great. Um, I uh, We at MAMP have really been enjoying being part of the coalition and um, so it's safe to say that any employer in Maine is invited to be part of the coalition, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, ab- absolutely. So for membership, we it's, it's actually very unique. Um, there are two types of membership. There is an active member, uh, which an organization, not an individual, but any organization or business or nonprofit can join. And it's $150 a year. And all members of your organization can participate in uh, all of the activities. If you don't want to be active um, and actively come to the bi-monthly um, Zoom meetings or the one annual um, meeting, then you can just support Diversity Hiring Coalition, and it's actually more money. It's $300. So uh, the encouragement is um, we want people to actively engage. We want people to learn from each other. We want people to stumble and fall and stand up and thrive together so that we can all sort of learn from that. That's great. Thank you so much, Shay. Thank you to all three of you for for being with us today. So helpful. I just want to say right now that I know that there are many organizations out out in the state that are working on these issues. I'm particularly glad that Shay was able to elevate some of the communities that we didn't have time to talk about specifically, um, w- whether it be uh, people with specific physical or mental challenges or our LGBTQ community or our um, people coming from different cultures and backgrounds um, and countries uh, to live in Maine and be successful here. And so I just want you to know that we did reach out to a lot of those organizations um, and we would we would love to have everybody featured at some point, but it would require a bigger event later in the year, maybe, Kelly, to get everybody around the table. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, just being kind of kind of a yeah, there you go. See? <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, so th- I'm so grateful to all of you 
Um, Bill, Karen, Shay, thank you so much. Um, I know there are organizations out there doing important work. If we didn't mention it, um, please let us know. Um, and um, I hope I'm not uh, scaring anybody on our team by saying we will make sure that we have a resource where people can get the links to the organizations like the three here and others that we know are trying to get people who want to work to work in Maine and want to work at nonprofits, let's just remember that we're all coming from very unique places. And in order for make us to connect people for with purpose around the state, it might take us getting out of our own comfort zone as employers and making a couple of extra steps. As Shay mentioned, it's hard work but we need to open our hearts and be patient and um, do the hard work to make sure that all of these communities um, are treated with empathy and compassion as we bring them into our workforce. So thank you all. It is 946, I'm gonna let you go and I can't wait to see you in September. Enjoy the rest of your summer. Thanks a lot, everybody. Take care.